Hi, this is Ray Kurzweil, and it's great to be with you here at the Manhattan Beach Project Longevity Summit, at least virtually. And this is a very important event because we're very close to a tipping point in human longevity. According to my models, we're only 15 years away from a point where we will, we will be adding more than a year every year, not just to infant life expectancy, but to your remaining life expectancy. And you would not get that impression from examining the past of human health and medicine. But human health and medicine, our understanding of biology, has undergone a, a grand transformation. It used to be hit or miss. We didn't even have the software that life runs on. Uh, we had no idea of the information processes that underlie biology. Now, we have the software that is the basis of biology. Uh, as an aside, that is a very good example of my law of accelerating returns, exponential growth in the fundamental properties of any information technology, because the general project was controversial when it was announced. In 1990, mainstream scientists were skeptics. We now see it as a hallmark of science, but at the time it was a renegade project. And mainstream scientists said, well, we, in 1989, we had our best PhD students and most advanced equipment and around the world. We collected one ten thousandths of the genome. This is going to take centuries. Halfway through the project, the skeptics were going strong, saying, I told you this wasn't going to work. Here you are, here you are halfway through the project, and you finished 1% of the project. This isn't working out. But that's right on schedule for an exponential progression, because when you're doubling every year, you start out doubling very little numbers. By the time you get to 1%, you're only seven doublings away from 100%. And indeed, very much on schedule, the project continued to double every year. It was done seven years later, a year ahead of schedule. So as of 2003, we have the software that life runs on. And it's not a metaphor. It is literally 23,000 little data programs which express themselves as proteins that describe how our biology works. We also have... <clears throat> that emerged around the very same time means of changing this outdated software. And the software is very out of date. I mean, consider, for example, the fat insulin receptor gene that says, hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. That was a great idea when our genes evolved thousands of years ago. We didn't have refrigerators. We needed to carry our calories with us. Now that underlies an epidemic of obesity. What would happen if we turned that gene off? That was actually tried in animal experiments near where I'm speaking now, the Johnson Diabetes Center, and these animals ate ravenously and remained slim. And it wasn't a fake slimness. They didn't get diabetes. They didn't get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. They got the health benefits of caloric restriction while doing the opposite. And there's several pharmaceutical companies rushing to bring that idea to the human market. And we have now technologies that can actually change the, this outdated software. Around the same time that the genome was collected, RNA interference was perfected. It got the Nobel Prize just a few years later, another example of the acceleration of biology. And we can now turn off selected genes in selected tissues uh, that may foster disease or obesity or aging processes. Uh, we, can, uh, we can turn on genes or add new genes that protect us from these diseases using new forms of gene therapy. I'm involved with, with a project where we take cells out of the body, in this case lung cells, scrape them out of the throat, uh, add a new gene in vitro, so it doesn't trigger the immune system, the old methods of gene therapy where we would add a new virus, uh, a, a new gene using viral vectors, used to trigger the immune system, would place the new gene in the wrong place. Doing it in vitro, outside the body, doesn't have those problems. We can then inspect that it got done, done correctly, replicate the cell a million fold, that's another new technology, inject it in the body, goes through the, the bloodstream, and then ends up back in the lungs, because they're lung cells, and this is actually cured a fatal disease, pulmonary hypertension, and it's undergoing human trials. And there are over a thousand drugs and other processes in the development and testing pipeline to either turn genes off using RNA interference, add new genes using different forms of gene therapy, so we're going to not have just designer babies, but designer baby boom boomers very soon, something I'm personally much more interested in. We can also design interventions on computers. Drug de development used to be called drug discovery, basically just accidentally finding something that has some therapeutic function without really an understanding of why it worked. 
uh, Pfizer was testing out a medication for lowering blood, blood pressure. Didn't work quite well enough, so they asked all the test subjects to send their medication back. The uh, women sent it back. The men didn't. Pfizer thought this was curious. They looked into it. That led to the discovery of uh, Viagra. And that's, uh, that's a true story. And that, and that was how drugs were developed, through accidental hit or miss. As a result, the development of health and medicine was not exponential. It was linear. Uh, industries go through transformations from where they are not information technologies to where they become information technologies. In the period where they're not information technologies, they progress in a linear fashion. Now that's been very helpful in health and medicine. Human life expectancy was 23 a thousand years ago. It was 37 in 1800. It was 48 in 1900. So we've made a lot of progress through this hit or miss uh, methodology. But now that health and medicine is, in, is an information technology, it will be subject to what I call the law of accelerating returns, which is that whenever you have an information technology, it progresses in power, price performance, effectiveness, capacity, bandwidth, at an exponential rate, doubling every period of time. Generally, that doubling time is about one year. And it's a very profound difference between a linear progression and an exponential progression. When something progresses linearly, as in one, two, three, four, five, if you take 30 steps, you get up to 30, and that characterizes health and medicine up until just recently. If it progresses exponentially, doubling every year, two, four, eight, 16, 30 steps later, you're at a billion. And this is not just a theory about the future. When I was a student at MIT, we all shared a computer, took up half a billion, cost tens of millions of dollars. The computer in your cell phone today is a million times cheaper. It's also a million times smaller. And it's a thousand times more powerful than the computer we all shared as students at MIT when I was an undergraduate. That's a billion-fold increase in the power of computers per dollar since I was a student. And we'll do it again in another 25 years. And we're also shrinking the size. Uh, it's shrinking at a size of about 100 in 3D volume per decade. So that's 100,000-fold shrinking in 25 years uh, while we make these technologies a billion times more powerful for the same cost. So that, that'll give you some idea of where we're, we're headed. And so health and medicine will be a, a million times more powerful in 20 years. All of these technologies are at an early stage, our ability to design interventions on computers, test them out on biological simulators, use methodologies like stem cells, uh, turning on and off uh, different genes. Uh, but these technologies will be a thousand times more powerful in 10 years, a million times more powerful in 20 years, a billion times more powerful in less than 30 years, probably about 25 years. And we really will have the means of reprogramming our, the information processes underlying biology away from disease and away from aging. And people say, well, okay, you can overcome certain diseases, but isn't there an absolute limit to biology? And we see certain limits, but we can also engineer around those. The telomeres, for example, which are the little beads at the end of DNA strands, one of which drops off every time a cell replicates, and when they're all gone, the cell goes into senescence, that does put some absolute limits on biology, and that's one of the reasons we have a proximate limit of about 120 years. But that, there's nothing in that methodology that we can't engineer around. In fact, just in the last few years, we figured out that there's a single enzyme, telomerase, uh, that can extend the telomeres, that cancer cells use to extend the telomeres. Now, we have to be careful. We don't just want to arbitrarily extend all the telomeres and encourage cancer, but there are ways of doing that in, in, the, in methods that are safe. And so we're going to have to develop these processes, but the technologies to do this, to design them on computers, to test them out on increasingly sophisticated biological simulators, is doubling in power every year. And we will have the means of overcoming disease, stopping and reversing aging processes. Aging is not just one thing. There's about a dozen different processes that we can identify. And we're making significant process progress in each one of these uh, different processes, uh, we ultimately will be able to just stop them and reverse them. There's actually a lot we can do already to slow them down. So let me quickly show you just how pervasive this process is, how many different fields it affects, and then come back to biology 
and how we can deploy what my co-author, Dr. Terry Grossman, and I call bri uh, the three bridges, a bridge to a bridge to a bridge. Bridge one is what you can do now. Bridge two is this perfecting of the information processes underlying biology, sometimes referred to as biotechnology. Uh, and that'll lead us to the third bridge, which is nanotechnology, basically going beyond biology, redesigning biology with mechanisms that are not necessarily restricted to biology. It's 